All right, well, let's, let's begin. Um, thank you all uh, for being here, both to those joining us in person and um, those joining online. My name is Kevin Corinth. I am a senior fellow here at AEI um, and also the deputy director of AEI's Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility, otherwise known as COSM. Uh, we are here today because of an important release. Uh, no, we will not be discussing the new iPhone, which will be coming out, or the new book on happiness by former, former AEI president Arthur Brooks with co-author Oprah Winfrey, both of which are being released today as well. Um, we have some admittedly tough competition, but I would argue that you have made the right choice by joining us in lieu of turning into Tim Cook or even Arthur Brooks. That's because we are talking today about some of the most important data intended to inform policymakers, the media, and the American population about how well we're all doing economically. Just an hour and a half ago, the United States Census Bureau released its estimates of families' income and how many fell into poverty last year. With these numbers, we can for the first time answer whether families were better off last year than the year before, whether the middle class in particular is doing better. We can answer whether wages and other sources of income grew fast enough to offset the increases in prices. We can also ask what has happened to people at the bottom. Did more or fewer families experience a level of deprivation called poverty? A whirlwind of policy changes have taken place over the past couple of years, and so it's essential to know how well-being has changed in the midst of this unique policy environment. Policymakers need to know whether things are getting better. Good news can provide assurance that things are working well, and bad news can motivate new directions for public policy. That is why we will begin today's event by presenting the new census numbers and what they tell us about changes in economic well-being. However, given the importance of these new data, there's an unfortunate reality, particularly when it comes to the poverty numbers. The ways that the Census Bureau measures poverty are significantly flawed, which makes the new poverty estimates difficult to interpret and insufficiently informative about how the worst off Americans are faring. That's a huge problem because one of the most important measures of a society's success is how the least well off are doing. In that light, we are highly fortunate to have two of the foremost scholars on poverty measurement with us today, Richard Burkhauser and Bruce Meyer. They, more than anyone else, understand the current problems with how we measure poverty and how to fix it. In terms of our schedule today, we will spend the next 30 minutes digging into the new census estimates of income and poverty, followed by time for Q&A from the audience. At 12.15, we will take a short 15-minute break for audience members to pick up a box lunch, which you should bring back to your table for a prompt 12.30 start to our second session on how to fix the way we measure poverty. Following presentations by Rich Burkhauser and Bruce Meyer, we will have a panel discussion that digs more into their remarks and we'll wrap things up with audience Q&A. With all that said, let's move right into our first panel on the new income and poverty numbers by introducing our three panelists. Uh, first on, farthest on, on that side, we have Scott Winship. Uh, Scott is the director of the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility here at AEI, where he also serves as a senior fellow. His research focuses on social mobility, poverty, and economic well-being. Among a number of other past positions, he previously served as the executive director of Congress's Joint Economic Committee under then-chairman Mike Lee, where he created the Social Capital Project. Scott holds a PhD in social policy from Harvard University. Angela Rashidi is a senior fellow and Rowe Scholar in Opportunity and Mobility Studies at AEI. Her research focuses on poverty and safety net programs, especially their effect on employment and family well-being. Previously, she spent almost a decade researching benefit programs for low-income populations in New York City, including as deputy commissioner in the city's Department of Social Services. Angela holds a PhD in public policy from the New School. Matt Weidinger is a senior fellow uh, and Rowe Scholar in Opportunity and Mobility Studies at AEI. His research focuses on safety net policies, including cash welfare, child welfare, disability benefits, and unemployment insurance. He previously served as Deputy Staff Director of the House Committee on Ways and Means and was the longtime Staff Director of the Subcommittee on Human Resources. Matt holds a Master's Degree in Political Science from the University of Chicago. All right, before we hear from our distinguished panelists, I'll begin by reviewing the headline findings on income and poverty from the newly released census reports. Then I'll ask each of our panelists for their key takeaways before moving to follow-up discussion and then uh, audience questions and, and answers. All right. 
So I am going to basically only be reviewing um, what the census just reported at 10 o'clock a.m. We were all in um, a war room watching them as they came out. Um, it was quite exciting. Um, but I will try to do a much worse job than census did in presenting their numbers, and then we'll let um, our panelists provide um, their analysis and commentary. Um, so first, let's take uh, the household median income estimates. Um, so um, census tracks um, median household income. This is a pre-tax measure, so it doesn't adjust for um, taxes. It doesn't adjust for stimulus payments um, or child tax credit changes in uh, 2021. Um, based on this measure, we saw a 2.3% decrease in real uh, median income. There was actually a, a substantial nominal increase, which was outweighed um, by the large uh, increase in prices in 2022 relative to 2021. Uh, median income was $74,580 in 2022 in real terms. Moving next to poverty. Um, so census has two poverty measures, an official poverty rate and a supplemental poverty rate. Uh, the official poverty measure, as we will learn a lot more about, does not um, include many resources. It does not adjust for taxes and it does not include in-kind transfers um, or the value of health insurance. Um, it also um, has other issues. Uh, so the official poverty rate decreased by 0 0.1 percentage points in 2022, um, which as census reminded us was not statistically significant. Um, census also has a supplemental poverty rate. This measure does adjust for taxes and it does include um, the value of in-kind transfers, although not the value of health insurance. Um, it updates thresholds in a complicated way, um, not based on inflation, but based on spending patterns of the middle class. Uh, the supplemental poverty rate increased substantially by 4.6 percentage points in 2022, um, such that in 2022, the poverty rate was 12.4%. Uh, Okay, so those are the main numbers we'll be discussing today. Um, in order to get anything interesting out of them, we'll be turning to our panelists. Um, I'd like to first turn to, to Scott um, and focusing first on the income side. And I will hand this to you in just one second, but I'll first ask my question so you have to listen to me. Um, so, so Scott, given the many years you've uh, been focusing on tracking income over time, debunking many, um, a lot of bad work, um, including a cost of thriving index most recently. Um, I'd like to ask you what you think about the Census Bureau's methods um, for measuring income over time and especially for adjusting for inflation. Um, I'd also like to hear what you make of the um, decrease in median income that we saw in 2022. Um, is that what you expected? And what does it say about how Americans are faring um, economically? Um, great, thank you, Kevin, for, for all those questions. Um, I think the first one was how I feel uh, the Census Bureau is doing um, in measuring income. Uh, I, I guess I would say it's getting better, I think. Um, the, the main change that they made this year, the only change I think that they made this year, uh, wasn't a change to their income measure. It was a change to their uh, inflation measure. Um, so this ends up being really important, as I'll, I'll show you some longer-term trends. Um, it's less important in, in looking at year-to-year -year changes. Uh, but essentially, they moved to a new... Uh, inflation measure that takes better account of the fact that when, when the price of one thing goes up, uh, people don't just have to absorb that price increase. They can switch to buying other stuff. They're worse off for it, but they're not as worse off as they would be if their only choices were keep buying the more expensive thing or don't buy it at all. Um, so that was a really important change uh, that, that improves the measure quite a bit, uh, but is more important for longer term trends. Um, you know, otherwise, I think, I think for income, um, we'll talk a lot about poverty today. This is sort of the only time I think that we'll talk about income. If you're looking at, at median income uh, or incomes higher up, um, uh, the, the Census Bureau does a, a pretty good job of that. Um, the, the things that are left out, as Kevin said, um, things like in-kind transfers, uh, don't make a huge difference at the median. Um, taxes can make a pretty big difference, and, and, and you'll see some uh, trends in a second that, in, that include post-tax measures as well. Uh, I think the Census Bureau started talking a little bit more about post-tax estimates the last couple of years. Uh, I think that's a, a positive uh, change as well. Um, 
so, so I think in, in terms, as opposed to poverty, where we're going to uh, run into all sorts of issues, I think um, the the measurement of, of kind of median income uh, is, is not too bad. Um, OK, so uh, I'll just present. Oop. There we go. OK. Um, so just to show you kind of how important um, the, the inflation changes over time, I'm going to show you uh, a few longer term trends. So this is real median household income. Uh, these only go to 2021. I had really hoped to update it to 2022 this morning, and my uh, Stata program uh, failed me. Um, so this this is in 2022 dollars, um, but but the most recent year on there is 2021. Um, and so the different lines, if you start with the blue, that's pre-tax household income. Um, uh, that declined by 2%, as Kevin said, uh, versus last year. In the long run, um, the old methods that the Census Bureau used to use would have shown an increase from 1979 to 1921. These were all going to be 1979 to 1921 uh, of 20% at the median over time. By its new measure, that's a 27% increase. Um, now, the Census Bureau, I think, would like the Bureau of Labor Statistics to produce this better measure before 2000. And if they incorporated that, uh, then you would see an increase over time of 33%. Um, so that's how much a difference that's going from uh, the top line uh, down successively to the next two blue lines. Um, that's how much of a difference uh, the, the choice of inflation measurement makes. The red line is the same thing, but for post-tax uh, household income, median post-tax. Uh, that declined by 9% um, uh, between uh, 19, tw- or, I'm sorry, 2021 and 2022. Um, over the long run, uh, the old methods would have shown a 31% increase. The, the new ones uh, give a 39% increase over the long run. Uh, a, an even better measure would be if they took it all the way back, that would be a 46% increase since 1979. So th- this isn't really consistent with a lot of the stories you hear about American carnage and sort of the middle class uh, being ravaged. Um, so, so, so that's important, I think, for political debates as well. Um, a couple more charts. This is, again, median household income, but it's for female-headed households um, over, over the same period of time. From, 21, from 2021 to 2022, the pre-tax measure uh, was actually up 2%. Um, interesting to think about why that might be. I don't have big theories on that, um, uh, but it was up as opposed to the overall median going down. Over the long run, um, the current numbers show a 50% increase since 1979. That would have only been a 41% increase by the old methods. And if we had an even better uh, approach, it would be something like 57% increase. So again, inconsistent with a lot of the narratives we hear about, uh, especially after welfare reform, that uh, that single parent families are doing terribly and there's $2 a day poverty. And uh, a, a lot of the narratives are just completely wrong. Um, and then finally, third chart, uh, this is real median uh, annual male earnings um, and compensation. The blue lines are pre-tax earnings. Um, uh, those declined by 4% uh, uh, from 2021 to 2022. Um, over the longer run, uh, the, the official numbers show them increasing by 17%. Um, the old numbers would have only shown a 10% increase. And if we'd had uh, a better measure going all the way back, it would show a 23% increase in median male earnings uh, over time. Um, the compensation numbers are the red line. Those, those look even better. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I should have noted uh, the, the red line here for female-headed household looks even better, too. That's a 79% increase in post-tax uh, uh, household income uh, for female-headed families. Um, for, for male earnings, um, if you're looking at post-tax compensation, you include uh, non-wage compensation in that measure. Um, that increases by 40% uh, since 1979. Uh, so again, this idea that, that men's earnings are, are tanking uh, and that that's why we have more single parenthood, that's why we have people who can't uh, have the number of children that they want to have, all of that narrative is just completely uh, contradicted by, by the evidence that we have. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn over to the, the poverty estimates. And to do so, we'll turn to Angela. I will also ask you a couple of questions, but feel free to veer off with um, other important points you'd like to make. Um, so can you, one, explain um, a little bit more the differences between the official poverty measure and the supplemental poverty measure? Um, it can get confusing that we have two different poverty rates produced by the Census Bureau. Um, what are the um, differences and, and what are the advantages of, of each? Um, and then, you know, despite these limitations, 
Um, is there anything we can learn um, from these poverty numbers? Um, and if so, what? Okay. Great, thank you, and it's great to be here. Um, so I'll start with just a very kind of high level, what are the difference between the two measures? Because I agree, it can get very confusing, and um, you know, depending on which measure, it really tells us different stories. So it's useful to think of the poverty measures in terms of resources and a threshold. So it's basically looking at the resources in a household and then comparing it to some sort of a threshold if you have resources above the threshold, you're not in poverty. Resources below the threshold, you're in poverty. So thinking about the two measures, so official poverty measure in terms of resources mostly only counts money income. So what households report they have in money income, mostly from earnings, Social Security, things like that, but money, does not count uh, government benefits um, that are in-kind or tax credits, which as we know are a large part of the safety net. Um, so on resources, it really you know, undercounts, uh, undercounts resources. In terms of threshold, the official poverty measure is an absolute threshold, meaning that it stays constant, adjusting for inflation over time. And it's based on kind of a 1960s standard of needs um, and then adjusts for inflation over time. The supplemental poverty measure, in terms of resources, does a better job than the official poverty measure because it does include um, almost all government benefits, um, or is so, I should say supposed to include government benefits, in-kind benefits like food assistance um, and tax credits. Um, and uh, the pro main problem with the supplemental poverty measure is on the threshold side in that it uses a relative measure. So it actually changes every year based on people, what people spend on uh, necessities. Um, but it's relative in the sense that that's not held constant, um, that it does change over time. And so the other problem with the, um, uh, both measures is just, and we'll hear this from uh, the second panel today, is just there's a lot of uh, misreporting of income, misreporting of benefit usage. So all of that uh, uh, combines with these other measurement issues uh, to really, uh, as Kevin mentioned, doesn't give us a real clear, clear picture of what's going on with poverty. So to kind of directly answer the question, well, can we get any insights then from what was released today? Um, and my, my response is actually mostly no. Um, I mean, I wish I could give a confident yes that this is going to tell us what is going on in terms of well-being in households across the country. But regrettably, no. Um, we don't get a lot of insight um, from the two measures that are produced today because of the measurement issues I mentioned, um, but also just this issue of misreporting. I think I, I can't really overstate enough what we see in terms of the measures that were released today do not really reflect reality because of all of these problems um, in terms of measurement that I'm describing. So does it give us insight into what's going on? Definitely not in the short term, but um, I think it does give us some insight if we look over the long term and we put into context these measures with all of those problems that I, that I described. So real quickly, and I'll just touch on a few things because what you will hear after you leave today or the headlines that have already come through is, oh, historic increase in poverty for children. Um, and um, you know, an unprecedented uh, poverty level increase um, uh, when you use the supplemental poverty measure, which again, you know, some experts believe is, is the superior measure. Um, but what you won't hear is sort of some of the other trends that we see in the long term that I think both measures, again, considering all the problems with the measures, can give us um, some insight. So I want to first just look to the longer term trend for children for child poverty, both from the official poverty measure, the OPM, and the supplemental poverty measure, the SPM. Over the long term, we see a lot of fluctuation with the official poverty measure, again, because it's mostly a money income measure. Not surprisingly, it fluctuates with the business cycle. But if you really do kind of pay attention to that long term uh, trend, even the official poverty measure, flawed measure we all recognize, but even that shows lower poverty uh, for children over time. 
When you look at the SPM, the red line, again, you know, better measure because it includes more resources, um, probably a better reflection in the OPM of well-being in the household. The longer-term trend, again, you know, positive, uh, positive for children. We see lower poverty rates. Um, obviously, the blip that we see, the, the sharp decline in, in child poverty with the SPM during the pandemic was due to economic stimulus payments, the expanded child tax credit. I want to point out, though, that even this decline is artificial because of it's based on decisions that the Census Bureau made about what, what income to include, when to include it, include it, and much of the income is actually uh, imputed. Um, so not necessarily based on what households actually uh, report as receiving in terms of income. So when we look at these longer term trends, yes, some insights, but again, much of these changes that we see because of these member, uh, measurement issues are somewhat artificial. Um, and then just the last thing I'll say, because we don't hear, well, actually two, two quick things. We, we um, often hear about race and ethnicity um, and the, the gaps in poverty. Again, insights we can gain from today's release, uh, looking over the longer term, is that with the official poverty measure, we have seen declines in child poverty, mostly for non-white children. Same story for the supplemental poverty measure, um, you know, larger gains for non-white children. And this chart actually shows the gap. So the, the poverty rates for non-white children, Hispanic and black children, compared to white children, and over time, this is the supplemental poverty measure, we have seen that gap narrow. So if we want to pull any insights from some of the data that's been released today, I think we can pull that there has been progress um, for children and especially for non-white children on poverty. And then finally, um, kind of the same story because all of these things are very much related, interrelated, um, but for female-headed households, which we know children in female-headed households do have the highest poverty levels, we've also seen progress over time even with these flawed, flawed poverty measures. So I'm going to end there because I know we're going to talk um, even more, um, and I'm going to turn it over to yep. Kevin to ask Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Matt, I would like to ask you even more about the poverty numbers because we are so focused on what's happening at the bottom of the distribution. Um, so in addition to anything else you, you've found, you, you can um, say about the trends in poverty um, and maybe things that we count or don't count, um, I'd love to hear more about what you think about the policy environment. So we had a lot of things going on in 2021 um, that Angela mentioned, the stimulus payments and the, the change of the child tax credit. Um, to what extent are these policies playing a role in the trends that we're seeing in the data released today? Sure. Um, okay, so review the bidding. We're supposed to talk about these two really complicated government reports uh, that show conflicting signals uh, and involve complicated things like family, uh, nature of families and race and inflation, and we're supposed to do it in less time than Aaron Rodgers spent on the field last night. <laughs> so I'll try to do my best to complete that. But um, the short answer is policy played a heavy role in all of this. Um, and you would figure that anti-poverty policy should affect poverty rates. Um, but depending on which survey you look at, the answer is, well, not so much. Um, official poverty measure, as Angela noted, uh, doesn't reflect a lot of that. The supplemental poverty measure does. So let's take a look at I'm going backwards. Uh oh. Back. There we go. Let's take a look at the difference between what the two measures include when it comes to low income benefits in the United States. So, in short, the blue, the stuff at the very bottom of this chart, is family assistance and SSI, so TANF welfare checks, things of that sort. Those are counted under the official poverty measure. The red, and the steepest inc increase is uh, uh, Medicaid, but then you've got SNAP um, and uh, EITC, child tax credit, all that, not counted under the official poverty measure. So what this shows is a rising share of what taxpayers do to try to keep people out of poverty or reduce their degree of poverty doesn't get counted in what the government terms its official poverty measure. I'd argue that's, that's a problem. And it's not only a problem in general, it was a problem especially during the pandemic, trying to understand what the heck is going on with pandemic programs. So um, I actually did a little report before the pandemic that looked at this question of 
what's counted versus not counted in terms of the official poverty measure, um, and found that the change um, between, uh, I think it was in the last two decades, uh, in terms of what's counted in the official poverty measure, that number increased by 9%. The amount that's not counted in terms of taxpayer assistance to help people not be in poverty rose by 146% in the prior two decades. So what that reflects is we're not giving these programs enough credit for what they're actually doing to, to try to relieve poverty. Um, during the pandemic, that reached somewhat epic scale. So um, you have to look to the supplemental poverty measure to really get an appreciation for most of the literally trillions of dollars the taxpayers provided. Um, and you know, so while today's headlines will say things like poverty rose by record amounts as pandemic aid declined, if you look at the last couple of years, similar headlines when these poverty reports came out, it suggested poverty dropped by significant amounts. Again, using the supplemental poverty measure if you count all that pandemic aid. So what are we, what are we talking about? Um, the, the dollar amounts are really pretty spectacular, uh, especially when you think about questions about poverty, which involve families with incomes you know, under $25,000, $30,000 or thereabouts. Three rounds of stimulus checks provided a family of four with $11,400 um, over the course of the two years of the pandemic. So the, the 2020 calendar year and now the 2021 calendar year that preceded the 2022 year that we're looking at. That was $850 billion in stimulus checks. Extended and expanded unemployment benefits provided, counting the state side, $900 billion in benefits over the two years. And I'll talk a little bit about how that changed. For a person who collected unemployment checks from the beginning of the pandemic until those federal programs ended in September of 2021, the amount they could have collected if they received the average amount across the country in terms of their unemployment value was $46,000. Under a second program that individuals could have collected, if they didn't qualify for the regular unemployment insurance program, they could have gotten $34,000 across that span. So again, huge numbers received by literally tens of millions of people. Food stamp expansions added $150 billion during the pandemic, and the expanded child tax credit uh, added apparently $113 billion in 2021. But some of that was paid to very low income parents when they filed their tax returns and received money in 2022. But as Angela suggested, was actually imputed to 2021 anyway. So there's, there's complexity in all that. And there's hundreds of billions of dollars more that the federal government gave to the states and states turned around and used to provide stimulus checks, uh, tax refunds, you, know, you name it, all sorts of other stuff that gets counted or not under the, these various programs. Um, so the largest of those programs ended in 2021. So that means they weren't there in 2022. So the third round of stimulus checks paid under the American Rescue Plan that passed in March of 2021 were paid generally in the early uh, part of 2021, obviously not paid in 2022. Same thing with unemployment benefits. The federal programs phased out in September of 2021, not paid in 2022. Child tax credit, you know, subject to this sort of oddity about when things were counted, paid in 2021, not 2022. And remember, for some of those benefits, we know, for example, unemployment benefits, the amount people received in unemployment checks for even in 2021, for 40% of re people receiving unemployment benefits, just their unemployment checks were bigger than what they made from working previously. That number was like 67% in 2021 when the even bigger $600 per week supplements were paid. So without even getting into the question of stimulus checks, expanded food stamps, um, you know, you name it, what, what have you otherwise, just looking at unemployment benefits, people were better off because of those benefits than they were previously from, from working. So unemployment checks are counted under the OPM sometimes, but not counted, uh, but, but uh, other things are only counted when you look at the SPM. Bigger picture is there's a lot going on um, and it really depends on which survey you're looking at to uh, determine what's really going on. The fact that as reported this morning, the SPM went up, it, it, the number of people in poverty under the SPM went up, is, should be a surprise to absolutely no one. For example, HHS issued a report in early 2022 that was titled this way, Federal Economic Stimulus Projected to Cut Poverty in 2021, that is the year before, though poverty may rise as benefits expire. So that is exactly what happened if you credit these programs with reducing poverty under the SPM especially, when the benefits go away, 
poverty will rise or appear to rise um, if you count those things. So that's really the kind of the bottom line. If you count something and give that additional something credit for reducing poverty when a temporary program is paid, it should surprise absolutely no one that poverty rises when those temporary benefits stop being paid. And I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you. So I have a couple questions, and we'll turn it over to uh, the audience. And, and this point's been brought up, but I think it warrants even more attention. The, by far, the headline is clearly going to be, and it already has been, the historic rise in child poverty based on the supplemental poverty measure. The SPM child poverty rate increased from 5.2% to 12.4% in a single year. That's a 138% rise in child poverty. There's been some doubt expressed about that, some people thinking that it's obvious. Um, what do we think actually happened to child poverty in um, 2022 compared to 2021? Um, did it rise and, and by how much? And, and what are some of the, if we don't think the SPM measures child poverty well, what are better ways to measure it? Um, I don't think any of us think that um, the official poverty measure does it well. Um, if not the supplemental poverty measure, how, how, how can we improve our measurement of child poverty and what would it say about the 2021 to 2022 change? Any volunteers to take a to start at that? Well, so I, I think, you know, as Matt said, uh, when you go from 2021, uh, which saw previously unseen levels of uh, government assistance in the form of economic uh, impact payments and all of the other expansions, unemployment insurance, uh, when, when all of that goes away in one year, you're going to see an increase in poverty. Um, so I, I think the increase is real. Um, I think the, the piece of it that is confusing, which, which Matt mentioned, uh, is sort of when you count the child tax credit, the expanded child tax credit benefits, um, the, the way the Census Bureau counted it. So in, in, in real life, uh, people got half of their benefits in calendar year 2021, uh, and then they got the other half of their benefits in calendar year 2022 when they filed their taxes. Um, the way the Census Bureau allocates uh, that income is they gave it all uh, to people in 2021 because they, that's when people filed their taxes. So for tax year 2021, you get that entire expanded uh, child tax credit. And so that reduced the poverty rate even more, probably you know, more than in reality uh, happened in 2021. And in reality, in 2022, a bunch of people received an expanded child tax credit uh, in when they filed their taxes. Um, but that doesn't get counted in the 2022 estimates because the Census Bureau already put it in the 2021 estimates. So a part of that decline really is artificial. In some sense, you should sort of, if we could if we could move half the expanded child tax credit income into 2022, that would be a better measure for sure. Um, you know, I, I think what would be a better measure, um, you know, the SPM gets a lot right in terms of what it counts as income. Um, I think it gets a lot wrong uh, in terms of where it sets the poverty line, how it adjusts its by geography, um, you know, making it a relative, a quasi-relative poverty line that partly changes from year to year based on how inequality changes, um, that's, that's the part where there's no consensus, uh, I think, among people who are serious scholars of this. Everyone sort of does agree that, that the SPM's uh, resource measure, what it counts as income, is a lot better. Can I just answer this question maybe from a policy perspective, too? I mean, yes, it's not going to be surprising to anyone that, that poverty, and let's focus on child poverty, for example, increased because... Um, you know, when temporary policies go away, poverty is going to increase. But I think that the other headline we're going to see is, well, why don't we then just continue these temporary policies? Why don't we just continue sending, you know, the expanded child tax credit, for example, to households to keep that poverty measure low? And I think that that's, um, you know, that I can understand why that is an obvious conclusion. 
Um, and part of what we're trying to point out is that maybe these swings we see aren't quite as big as we actually, or as the data suggests they are. But to Scott's point, when you send money to households, if you have a threshold of poverty and it brings them above the threshold because of the money you're sending them, it's, you know, it's not rocket science. It's going to reduce that poverty rate. But then the question is, well, why not? Why is this not a long-term strategy? And there's a couple of you know, really crucial reasons why it's not. One is the cost. I mean, we are talking about an expanded child tax credit that was, what, $100 billion a year? $1 trillion over 10 years. As we know just from the recent news about the current deficit, that does not seem sustainable to me, um, and I'm sure to a lot of others. The other thing is that some of these short-term reductions in poverty might actually have longer-term negative consequences for households, meaning lower employment, and then households don't benefit from those non-financial things that come along with employment, more single parenthood, you know, all the, all the potential negative consequences associated with lower employment that might happen because of these benefits. So yes, again, obviously poverty is going to reduce when you send money from the government to households in the short term, but I do think we have to think about the longer term implications of some of these policies and what is really realistic from a financial perspective as well as just a well-being perspective for these households. Just to add a quick point. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Just to add a quick point to that. You know, I think it, you hear a lot of people who say, well, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that people got the expanded child tax credit in 2021 and they didn't reduce their employment. And you know, I, we might hear from Bruce different, there's some other evidence on that. Um, but I, I would say, like, that wouldn't surprise me at all because the short term effects of receiving a program that is set to expire at the end of the year. Uh, are going to be very different than if you had a permanent program that year after year after year gave people uh, the, the the expanded child tax credit, whether they work or not. That's going to have a very different effect in the long run than the short-term effect of people getting something that they know is going away. Yeah, and I'll also just throw out there that um, the programs are expensive while they operate. Um, but they continue to have costs, right? So the federal deficit is increasing this year compared to what it was last year. One of the reasons for that is interest rates going up, so the, our debt is becoming more expensive. So, and that's at a time when the unemployment rate's 3.5%. So that's actually really not a good sign for the country that our, our deficits are rising when we're at arguably, you know, according to the Bidenomics folks, um, at you know, the best economy we've ever had. Um, so anyway, the administration wants to take credit in some ways for the reduction in the deficit, but a lot of the measures that were taken in the course of the pandemic are now contributing to deficits going back up. And actually a lot of, in fact, all of the decline in the deficit that we've seen is due to the expiration of those very programs in the first place. All right, well, thank you. Uh, let's turn it out uh, over to questions from the audience. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand, uh, wait for a microphone, state your name, and then ask a concise question, please. Um, thank you. Let's start over here. Hello, <clears throat> Jason Turner from Secretary's Innovation Group. Uh, it seems to me that the, the serious flaw in the SPM is the absence of a fixed threshold of poverty, because at that point, you can no longer measure whether you're actually making improvements against the fixed threshold, and instead you're only measuring income equality, which I think was part of the objective of, of uh, introducing the SPM. This question is for Matt. Matt, what's the current political environment over the use of the SPM? Is it displacing official poverty? And is there a move afoot to challenge the SPM for, the, for its deficiencies? So um, this has been kind of a running dialogue for a long time um, about whether to replace the OPM with the SPM. Um, it, it hasn't happened yet. I don't think we're you know, at the point of, of doing that. Um, it's, um, what can one say about this? Uh, I 
I, I find it unlikely to occur, occur for a number of reasons that the SPM will actually replace the official poverty. One of which is it actually changes the locus of where poverty exists. So if you look at poverty under the official poverty measure, a lot of poor states are the places that one would think make sense. Uh, Alabama, Mississippi, you know, deep south states, things like that. The SPM, because of some of the things that it does in terms of trying to um, uh, count things like housing costs, actually relocates the where poverty is to the coast. So it moves poverty from red states to blue states, which has a pretty significant implications when it comes to distribution of federal funds. And that sort of food fight doesn't tend to end very well um, uh, on Capitol Hill. So I, I find it somewhat unlikely that that's going to happen. There, there is a part of this, though, that um, part of the discussion is um, it involves how words really matter. And I think from like an average American standpoint, this has got to be inscrutable, right? The federal government operates and annually announces something it calls the official poverty measure. Yet, as I showed, there are hundreds of billions of dollars that taxpayers provide to low-income individuals that's not counted towards the official poverty measure. You would hope that at some point, sort of things would come to a head and people would say, hey, this is how we should actually run this railroad. But that hasn't happened for a whole bunch of different reasons that we can, we can uh, discuss some more. But um, I, I don't think it's imminent that the SPM is about to become the nation's official poverty measure. All right. Uh, yep, this gentleman here in the back. Hi, uh, Clarence Carter, Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Human Services. I, I think um, you, Matt and Angela, you've done a good job of explaining the difference between the two. The question is why? W why the two different measures? It doesn't seem to make sense that one, you would have a measure that doesn't include the, uh, the, 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 the transfers and that sort. So, any a sense as to why there are two different measures? Political realities. Um, I mean, the official poverty measure has to stick around. It's tied to benefit eligibility, as you know. Um, and but then there's a recognition that it's flawed as a, really a, a measure of well-being. So we need something else. And that's the supplemental poverty measure. So yeah, I mean, I think like any, like anything in this town, there's historical precedent. You kind of keep things around because of that historical precedent, and you try to improve upon it not by getting rid of things, but by adding more. <laughs> and so, I mean, actually, we have more than two measures. I mean, Columbia puts out an anchored supplemental poverty measure that addresses the relative threshold that, as a researcher, I pay more attention to Columbia's measure than anything the Census Bureau puts out. I um, mean, they're using Census Bureau data, but they are, they're producing it themselves. So yes, we'll probably end up with more. There was a report that came out that wants even another one, and they call it principal poverty measure, I think. So we will likely get more. But yeah, I think it's political realities, mostly. Yeah. Some of it, you know, these things that We've changed the nature of anti-poverty programs in the country, right? So we used to do things like welfare checks and unemployment benefits. And so then along comes tax policy in the 1970s, and we start moving in the direction of tax credits for all sorts of different reasons, and food stamps, and Medicaid, and you know what have you. So the nature of the kind of anti-poverty focus has changed over time. That doesn't get reflected in the OPM, which began in the 1960s. Um, so, but then the question becomes, well, why, hasn't, why haven't policymakers adapted to that? I think some, so I worked on Capitol Hill for a long time, and so this is somewhat jaundiced, uh, forgive me, but I think some of it is because policymakers could take from the OPM for a long time what they wanted. The left could look at the OPM and see that the EITC and then the child tax credit and SNAP and what have you doesn't get reflected there. So, aha, see, more is needed to solve poverty in America because it remains stubbornly high. <laughs> Folks on the right could have a different view saying, Ah, see, we're you know, spending all this money, but it's not having a dent on poverty. We should get rid of these programs. So the OPM as it exists now sort of feeds both of those narratives. So at various times, and this year I would say would be the maximum moment of that time because of the expiration of the pandemic programs we were talking about, some might look at the change in the SPM and see that it, it you know, confirms their worst fears about poverty in America, that it just like dramatically went up because we took away all of these benefits, which by the way, were supposed to be temporary in nature in the first place, right? So 
there's there's a, a large portion of that uh, at work on both sides, I would say. All right, well, fortunately we have, oh, I will do one very last quick question. If, you do, I, I, if Dave, you can answer, ask very quickly. So he, I'd like to push that right, a little more on, on income. So sure. I, sounds so great. I, it's good, good to hear that the panel We're out likes of time. the SPM Sorry. resources. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to say, so Scott, if you looked at the report, you know, the, in, the, the, the inequality of income with money income went down, but after tax income, it went way up mainly for the fall at these bottom quintiles. So would you suggest that we should move to a better measure of income as well? Uh, is, your, is your question, do I still defend, uh, do I still think an after-tax measure is good even though it showed a rise in inequality uh, in 2022? Well, even beyond that. So the after-tax is just after-tax. It doesn't include any of the SNAP and other things. It just is after-tax. Shouldn't sure. it go, shouldn't even go beyond that? Uh, yeah, so that's right. So I was talking mainly about median income trends, um, and you're absolutely right. If you're looking at inequality, uh, then it makes a big difference. Essentially, incomes are measured pretty well in the middle. They're measured pretty badly at the bottom, and they're measured pretty badly at the top. Um, and so if you're doing anything that's comparing the bo that's looking at the bottom or comparing the bottom to the top, uh, it, makes a, it makes a huge difference for sure. The other thing I was going to say is that even in the middle, um, a, a big improvement, I think, would be if we included employer-sponsored health insurance as income. Uh, because, you know, presumably workers like employer health insurance or they would be demanding from their employers that they just give them cash. If they just got cash, that would show up as income. Um, so employer-provided health insurance should be in there. Um, but yeah, that's a good point, David. So if you're looking at inequality, uh, the, the improvements matter a lot. All right, well, I am not going to keep people from lunch any longer. Um, so fortunately, we have another panel coming up at exactly 12.30, um, after which point there'll be time for more um, questions, which we will get to. Um, and you can ask more questions um, about poverty at that point. Um, so at this point, you can go and get a box lunch, which I believe is right in the hallway through these doors. Um, please come back to your table to eat the lunch. Um, and we'll be starting at exactly 12.30 for our next uh, session. Thank you.
All right, so uh, we've got a great second panel coming up. You're actually going to hear uh, a couple of presentations first from two of the of the real giants of poverty measurement. Um, I'm going to introduce um, all three folks first, um, and and then we'll uh, we'll have the presentations, and then we'll have uh, a panel and some time for Q and A at the end. Um, starting with someone who is not speaking, not giving a presentation, but will be on the panel. Um, Kevin Corinth is the deputy director of the Center on Opportunity and Social Mobility here at AEI. Uh, prior to that, he was uh, uh, leading the uh, Senator Lee's staff on the Joint Economic Committee, running the Social Capital Project there. Um, prior to that, he was working with, with Bruce uh, on uh, a big project called the Comprehensive Income uh, Database uh, that produced some of the most important work that's been done in the last uh, three or four years, for sure, on income and poverty measurement. And then prior to that, he was uh, here at AEI. He's an expert on uh, housing and homelessness, um, income measurement, uh, and a number of other issues as well. Um, uh, We will have, uh, speaking second, um, Bruce Meyer. Um, Bruce, uh, like Rich, I I view as a real mentor. Um, He's the McCormick Foundation professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, he co-chaired a recent interagency technical working group on evaluating alternative measures of poverty, which we'll probably talk a little bit about. Uh, he's a non-resident senior fellow at AEI, uh, and he's perhaps the leading expert on the measurement of, of income and poverty. He's done uh, incredibly important work on uh, trends in poverty after welfare reform um, uh, and material hardship. Uh, but first, we'll be hearing uh, uh, from Rich uh, Burkhauser. Rich is the Emeritus Sarah Gibson Blanding Professor of Public Policy at Cornell University. Um, Prior to that, he served uh, on President Trump's uh, Council of Economic Advisors as a member. Uh, That was from 2017 to 2019. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at AEI. He's done path-breaking work uh, around uh, minimum wage, disability, um, uh, income mobility, uh, and, and related topics. Um, so Rich is going to present first on the history of poverty measurement. Uh, he'll be followed by Bruce, who'll be presenting on using administrative data and consumption data to improve poverty measurement. Um, so with that, I'll let uh, uh, Rich take it away. Thank you, Scott. So um, one of the nice jobs that I have is uh, to talk about the history of the poverty measure so I didn't have to be in the war room to try and figure out what the heck was going on in 30 minutes so you'd be prepared to uh, present these uh, talk, just-in-time uh, talks earlier. Uh, so uh, in uh, August uh, 2017, I was minding my own business. I was uh, emeriti at, uh, at uh, Cornell and had just uh, gone to the University of Texas and uh, was preparing to teach one course in the fall of uh, 2017 when I got a call from Kevin uh, Hassett, who asked me if I would be interested in being a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm going to say that uh, the interview that I had uh, a few days later for that job uh, was critical to my understanding of what the role of the Council of Economic Advisors is. Uh, And it uh, came with, uh, uh, I was in a room with Kevin and uh, two other guys who were political guys. And uh, one of them said to me, uh, Rich, uh, uh, Kevin's super. Uh, If he likes you, great. uh, We'd be happy to have you come. Uh, But I just want to tell you two things. Uh, First, uh, your job is to tell us, to the best of your ability, the economic consequences of any policies that we propose. Uh, but second, we reserve the right to completely ignore your advice. <laughs> so once you understand the rules of the game, and that was true of all CEAs, quite frankly, uh, it, it gives you an appreciation of what your job really is, and it's to try to hang in there and to try to warn people of both uh, celebrate the good things that we think might happen, but uh, warn them about uh, the the things that uh, might be negative consequences. So this is me. Um, 
uh, in the uh, uh, in the signing of the 2019 economic report of the president, with the president uh, in front and uh, all us members of the council uh, uh, with our faces in the opposite direction. Uh, what uh, what we were talking about there was the uh, one thing that the council is required to do, and that is to uh, help the president to write the economic report of the president, which has to happen 10 days after the, um, uh, the budget uh, is proposed. Uh, uh, what, uh, another thing that we did, though, was to write reports. And uh, one of the reports that uh, I was uh, involved in, and Kevin uh, Corinth also, was uh, a uh, report that we did uh, in 2018 called Expanding Work Requirements in Non-Cash Welfare Programs. And uh, this was a proposal to try to uh, see, we were asked to uh, see how many people would be affected if uh, we in fact put uh, work requirements on uh, uh, working age people without disabilities on these programs. And uh, we knew that was gonna be a pretty controversial topic, uh, but we were surprised uh, that it wasn't the thing that drew the headlines the next day. And I want you to take this as a sense of what we've ju just talking about uh, with uh, poverty measures and the importance of poverty measures, and particularly how uh, the, the impact of academics is on what the uh, newspapers say the next day, uh, whether we're working uh, with the president or whether we're working with uh, different departments. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll do this with a, a quiz, but I... I think in this uh, audience, uh, you uh, know the answers to these questions. Uh, so, uh, uh, the question is, do you uh, agree with the current, uh, with this statement? The current uh, US uh, measure of poverty is uh, demonstrably flawed, judged by today's knowledge, it needs to be re replaced. If you were listening at all to uh, the, the comments before lunch, you know that that is correct. Oops, excuse me. That, uh, uh, okay, so these didn't come out the way I thought they would be. You actually see all of these things. Uh, yeah, so that, that statement comes from the uh, Measuring Poverty, uh, a new approach in 1995 uh, 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 NAS report on that. Uh, the second one, official poverty measures, uh, the OPM is, uh, has a severe flaws that distort our understanding of both uh, the level of poverty and how it changed over time. That was done by the um, uh, economic report of the president in 2014. So these are well known, these are well known outcomes. Uh, we said something else. We said based on historical standards of uh, material well-being in terms of engagement, our war in poverty is largely over and a success. And uh, that's what uh, we said in our July 2018 report. And uh, it drew the attention of the press. Uh, and this is what the press had to say. Uh, I don't have time to read them all, but the, the, uh, uh, the headlines uh, that, that captured me most was, the Trump administration's new poverty reports builds a phony rationale to punish the poor. Uh, Trump's administration calls war and poverty over, moves on a war uh, on poor people, that sort of reaction. That, as an academic, shocked me because I thought it was well known that, um, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, poverty rates had substantially declined um, over time, and that, in fact, if you uh, had been reading Bruce Meyer's work from 2012, which a number of us uh, had, that, uh, in fact, it was the case, and this is what our uh, uh, report was based on when we slightly mentioned this in one of the pages of it, uh, that... Uh, Based on uh, the uh, consumption poverty measure, indeed, uh, the poverty rates um, uh, were uh, way down. Okay, so what I'm going to do is very quickly uh, go through uh, the, our responses to that. Uh, the second paper here is a response that was in uh, a chapter in the Council of Economic Advisors report. But since I'm an academic and I was so frustrated by the uh, way that this obvious fact was true that uh, based on historical standards as LBJ set them up in the 1960s, uh, surely uh, uh, poverty was almost, uh, uh, was sh clearly a success and, uh, 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 and well over based on the criteria that 
the Johnson administration set. All right, so what am I talking about? Uh, LBJ uh, said uh, in this famous thing, uh, talked about one-fifth of the population being poor, uh, but he also talked about uh, getting out of, the poor getting out of poverty by uh, 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 getting into the labor force effectively and working. Uh, so what are the conditions? We've actually talked about these uh, 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 already. Uh, and uh, one, uh, Johnson used a, um, a uh, scientifically arbitrary but policy relevant 20%. Where did that come from? Bob Lantman basically was at, uh, who was the real father of the poverty measures, uh, showed uh, the Johnson administration a distribution of people's income uh, 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 which is sort of a, a bell curve sort of thing. Uh, and he said, Mr. President, uh, here's the distribution of people's uh, income. You decide, tell us what, who you want to target for uh, uh, these poverty programs. And it was a political decision that Johnson chose 20%. Uh, and that's uh, scientifically arbitrary, but policy relevant. Uh, <laughs> The uh, Molly Oshansky and, the, and, and SSA have another way of doing things, uh, which unfortunately, in my view, the uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences in, in 95 uh, used uh, both to set a new poverty threshold, but more importantly, to use that measure uh, to uh, change the thresholds over time. Uh, President Johnson focused on absolute standards. That's the thing we've been talking about before that was raised. Uh, and uh, if you do that, you only increase poverty rates by the, uh, by the uh, inflation rate. If you uh, link it to uh, changes in uh, uh, consumption of whatever goods you want to talk about, then you're going to get some aspect of uh, uh, relative uh, measures in there. Uh, and then the third thing you need to do, and this is what we all agree, is you have to capture all resources and use more appropriate sharing units. All right, so um, what, uh, what we talked about when people asked us about these different poverty measures is we have an official poverty measure, we have a supplementary poverty measure, we have an absolute sup, uh, 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 supplementary poverty measure, and we have a consumption-based poverty measure. The measure that we used initially was the... Uh, was the um, uh, Bruce Myers work uh, in our report. But what we did is we actually, uh, in our paper, which is being published in the uh, Journal of uh, Political Economy, uh, took those original ideas of the Johnson administration and showed what would happen if you actually had a better measure of full income. So here's the uh, official poverty measure. Uh, these are the various po poverty measures you could use. The consumption poverty measure is the one that we used originally, and it was down to 2.0% in 2019. The others tack much closer to the official poverty measure, perhaps by coincidence, but whatever, the supplementary poverty measure actually follows the official poverty measure better than the absolute one or the uh, uh, consumption poverty measure would do. But the bottom line is once you fully measure the sources of income in uh, that people are, uh, uh, have access to, uh, and you use an absolute measure, uh, based on historical standards of material well-being and the terms of engagement, our war on poverty is largely over and a success. And it goes down all the way to 1.6. Uh, if you use a relative po poverty measure, which is what the Europeans do, it turns out when you anchor that at uh, the 19.5 rate, that's a 0.55 of median income. And then uh, because it's relative and uh, economic growth uh, is, is uh, driving the uh, uh, thresholds, uh, Johnson's uh, standard, we, we wouldn't have success. So the issue is, which do we do better? These, uh, are, these three, all, all four of these things, are variations of those two extremes, except for Bruce's uh, uh, consumption poverty measure, which measures uh, a consumption measure which is valid. Uh, OK, so uh, I, I want to get to, uh, let me just get to, uh, where I really want to talk about things. Here is, here is the uh, uh, official poverty measure adjusting for various things. The equivalency scale doesn't matter. 
Uh, if you uh, change to uh, households, uh, poverty goes down. If you change to, uh, if you then bring in uh, uh, post-tax transfers, if you then bring in uh, non-cash transfers, and if you bring in health insurance, you get something that's similar uh, in, in its outcomes to what Bruce was talking about with regard to consumption. Uh, if you then uh, choose the different um, uh, inflation rates, you'll get to a, an even lower point. But here is uh, the sort of major story uh, with regard to how things have changed, not only overall, but with regard to uh, 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 minority groups. Blacks' poverty rates in uh, 1963 uh, were over 50% while uh, everybody else's, uh, the, the total one is 19.5. Is, uh, so you see dramatic drops for blacks uh, and uh, for uh, uh, kids, uh, black kids and work, working age people, and of course for everybody with regard to age 65. All right, why should this be no shock to anybody? Bottom line, think about the distribution. The 1963 distribution is in blue. If you... Uh, Look at the absolute poverty measure, the threshold in 1963, uh, in, these are all in 2019 dollars, 19.5 percent are in poverty uh, with that absolute 1963 threshold in 1963. Uh, but what's happened uh, between 1963 and 2019? There's been a tremendous movement in the distribution. It's become more unequal, but it's also moved to the right for sort of stochastic dominance, for people who care about that stuff. Uh, if you hold the threshold constant in 63 terms, what was 19.5% of the population at that standard comes down to 1.6. But if you use a relative standard, that is you're looking at uh, 0.55 of median income, uh, then it's 15.6. That explains what's going on. That's what's been driving things. Things have gotten a lot better for everybody since 1963. Okay, so yes, absolutely we should increase uh, uh, increase the thresholds to take into account uh, 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 a, a wealthier society. Uh, but that doesn't refute the fact that if we just choose 10.5, anchored things at 10.5, which was last year's, uh, was, which was the poverty rate, the official poverty rate in 2019, you'd still see that if you use 2019 standards, 70% of the population in 1963 were in poverty. Okay, so I've got just one or two more things I want to show you. Uh, this is the share of the population with less than half of full income from market sources. This is the bad news. President Johnson, we didn't get to this terrific outcome for reductions in poverty because of self-sufficiency. If you look at uh, the population in each year whose in income from, from uh, market sources is uh, less than 50%, uh, in 1963, blacks had only about 18%. Only about 18% of blacks had their, more than 50% of their income coming from in-kind uh, and from government sources, taxes, and transfers. That grew, and the only time it substantially decreased was uh, it went from uh, 18 to 33% in uh, 1993. Welfare reform reduced that uh, share of people who were uh, uh, having less than half of their full income from uh, uh, market income. Uh, so what that tells you is that based on historical standards of material well-being and the terms of engagement, President Johnson's war on poverty is largely over and a success with respect to poverty reduction. Who could have doubted that except the press a few years ago? And hopefully not today, but I wouldn't count on it. Uh, two, the reduction in poverty was mainly driven by substantial expansions of, social, of the social safety net via federal government tax and transfer programs, not by an increase in self-sufficiency. You can get that when you link subsidies to work and not to not working. And obviously it's time to begin a new war on poverty with poverty thresholds that recognize current living standards, but one that focuses on giving all Americans a chance to develop and use their capacities so they can share as others share in the promise of this nation, which is what Johnson said. And in fact, in 2019, in a, a, a miracle of uh, uh, the uh, executive branch, uh, the interim report that uh, Bruce held 
uh, was uh, overseeing, the final report of that technical group came out and talked about having relative poverty measures and absolute poverty measures. Uh, and this is, in fact, what we need to begin to think about. Rather than limiting our horizons to slightly improving a supplementary poverty measure that is quasi-relative, let the politicians decide uh, let, let the politicians win occasionally. If, you, if, 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 you, if, if I were advising uh, uh, President Biden, I would tell him, President Biden, why don't you pick a uh, absolute threshold, start over again, have an absolute threshold, and you'll actually succeed in a few years in reducing poverty. Occasionally, let's show that the government actually succeeds in doing something. That's what an absolute poverty measure will allow you to do. Relative, very tough to do that. I should just, I, I should, my final note, this is Bob Lantman's book. If you doubt what I've said about the history of the poverty measure, he's the guy who wrote it. He tells all about it. We just copied some of his stuff to uh, get in that JP paper. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rich. Um, and next we'll have uh, Bruce Meyer using administrative data and consumption data uh, to improve poverty measurement. Um, we got a, there we go. Thank you, Scott. Um, I also need to thank, oh, where is the clicker? This, I, I use this. Ah, okay, great. Green button. The big green button. Okay, I can handle that. Um, so I also need to thank the um, previous presenters because they've laid out much of what I want to talk about and certainly um, motivated what I'm going to mention. Uh, much of this presentation is based on joint work with Jim Sullivan, uh, Derek Wu, and others. And I'm required by the Census Bureau to say that I'm expressing my own uh, opinions and conclusions, not theirs, and that all of our results, which often rely on confidential data, have been through disclosure review. Um, you've heard that the new poverty numbers released today, um, both the OPM and the SPM, are more deceptive than informative. The OPM doesn't count most of what we do to reduce poverty, and the SPM tries to, but it relies on data that badly underreports key programs and income sources and badly imputes taxes and tax credits. To give you a couple examples, it missed more than 60% of the 900 billion in unemployment insurance that Matt mentioned, and 45% uh, of single parent EITC recipients were also missed in the survey that is used to construct the OPM and the SPM. The SPM also moves the goalposts, the thresholds, in odd and opaque ways, so it's hard to interpret. Um, Thus, um, I'm going to focus on what we can learn from the data, focusing on the long-run changes and consumption data. Consumption data has problems that um, expenditures also tend to be underreported, but it has a lot of advantages. It's preferable to income-based poverty measures for many purposes. Um, there are four overarching themes to my comments. Um, first, the price index used to adjust the official poverty measure for inflation overstates inflation. The implication of that is poverty has fallen more than advertised over time. Uh, second, survey income data when compared to either administrative microdata or aggregate accounting data shows that there's severe underreporting that has increased over time. So the implication of that is poverty is lower than advertised and it's uh, fallen more 
than advertised. And third, uh, consumption measures solve some of the underreporting and measurement problems of income. Implications of that are that uh, deep poverty, the share of people below half the poverty line, uh, is pr particularly overstated, as is the poverty rate for single parents and the elderly, uh, particularly overstated. Poverty measures should be evaluated. Fourth point, uh, poverty me measures should be evaluated as to whether they meet the overarching goal of identifying the most disadvantaged and assessing their changing prevalence. An implication of that is many of the SPM elements are counterproductive. For example, it would be a bad idea to select areas where people spend more in housing and adjust thresholds upward there, as the SPM does. A corollary is that it would be a bad idea to direct more resources to those areas at the expense of places where people spend less on housing. Um, my plan for the presentation is to elaborate on each of these four themes. Uh, much of the evidence that I'm going to rely on comes from the Comprehensive Income Data Set, or affectionately the KID uh, project that I lead. The project improves income measures by linking tax data and data from 12 major government programs at the individual or family level to Census Bureau surveys. It provides the most comprehensive and accurate income measures available. I'm going to also describe how federal agencies are responding to some of the issues that we've raised. Uh, some steps are being taken to solve these key problems. Some other steps have been proposed that, frankly, would take us in the wrong direction. Um, so first, on bias in the price index that's used to adjust inflation, which means that, adjust for inflation, which means that the thresholds go up too fast over time, and poverty goes up faster than it would if we had a truly absolute poverty measure, which we don't quite, because the thresholds are going up in real terms. So the CPIU overstates inflation by about eight-tenths of a percentage point per year. That's a, a rough estimate. Um, uh, this is not something that is easy to estimate, but the 0.8% is the, a number that comes from a nice survey by um, Brent Moulton uh, that was published by the Brookings Institution. He led in sequence the two major um, federal agencies that construct price indices. So uh, it's an authoritative statement. Um, price indices are based on changes in the price of a basket of goods. Unfortunately, the basket that people actually consume changes over time, leading to biases due to substitution, new goods, quality improvements, outlet changes. In short, consumers substitute away from goods that go up in price towards other goods that haven't seen price increases. New goods are incorporated in the bundle that's examined slowly. So initial price declines in those goods are often missed. For example, cell phones weren't incorporated in the, the bundle for the CPI for 15 years. Improvements in quality are often missed, and lower prices at big box stores are ignored. While the effect of this kind of bias is small over one year, uh, because of compounding over a few decades, it's enormous. So when you um, fix the poverty rate uh, at 13% in 1980 and calculate it using consumption data. Um, if you use the CPIU as your adjustment of the thresholds, 
The poverty rate is 6.2% 41 years later, but it's 1.5% if you bias adjust the consumer price index. Um, second, um, when the Census Bureau survey data are compared to either individual tax or program data or to accounting totals, they almost invariably indicate underreporting. The pattern has many implications. The share of individuals below poverty cutoffs is much lower than reported. Since the problem has really worsened over time, it means that poverty has fallen more over time than reported. It also means that the static poverty reduction of many of our government programs is greater than reported. Let me take you through some of the evidence for this problem and some examples of the implications. Uh, this figure shows the um, proportional underreporting of four programs in three of the Census Bureau's surveys. Uh, the, um, it basically compares weighted totals that are reported in the survey to what was paid out by the government. Um, the surveys used to, that is used to calculate the official poverty measure in the SPM is the one in pink here. And it indicates that much of program dollars are missed. 42% of SNAP is missed in this survey. And these are old data um, from the early 2000s. And these problems have gotten much worse since then. Now, while government programs are important for the poor, earnings uh, are much more important for, um, for the poor and, and other uh, groups as well. Um, both the survey data that we use and the administrative data alone understate total earnings relative to what the national income accounts say people earned. Even our combined total earnings, where we take our best uh, shot at combining survey and administrative data to calculate earnings, even our combined total earnings measure is below these benchmarks. We're slightly high for wage and salary earnings, but still very low compared to self-employment earnings. We're only capturing 59% of self-employment earnings in what we're doing. Um, and it's not just government programs and earnings that are underreported. Uh, pension income is sharply underreported. And as I mentioned earlier, maybe the most important observation is all of this has gotten a lot worse over time. I should also mention uh, taxes because um, it turns out that in this recent report, uh, all of the um, difference between the SPM and the OPM um, comes from taxes, or at least the changes over time. And taxes are imputed in, in the CPS based on not very good information. So as I mentioned at the start, 45% of single parent EITC recipients are missed. Um, in, the, in the CPS. Um, so what are the implications of this underreporting in surveys and what is the impact of corrections? Um, I should say that a difficulty with the data that we're re relying on that links survey and administrative data is that we're not able yet to do it on a timely basis. But if it was a priority for the statistical agencies, I think we could do it. As a result, I'm going to show you um, data for 2016 here. Um, so what this figure shows is the share of individuals below the poverty line 
using progressively broader income concepts. The poverty rate based on survey data alone is shown in maroon, and the one that uses survey data combined with administrative data from the IRS and from various government agencies uh, is shown in uh, gray. Uh, you probably want to focus on the last two bars because that's the broadest measure of income. It's uh, quite similar to the SPM definition of resources and similar to the um, uh, comprehensive income measure that Rich presented but we're not including uh, health insurance in, in this calculation. And you'll see that the poverty rate is 9% um, in 2016 just using survey income, but it's 5.3% when you use a combination of the administrative data and the survey data to correct for the underreporting. That's 41% lower. Uh, and this figure still doesn't include administrative data for many programs, TANF, general assistance, workers' comp, and unemployment insurance, because we don't currently have the data or have the approval to use uh, the data. Now, um, that was what is true at a point in time. Um, that's the effect of correcting the survey errors that we can um, in 2016, but how does the combination of administrative data with survey data affect changes in poverty over time? Um, so here again, you probably want to focus on the last two bars. What they indicate is that um, poverty fell by 45% between 1995 and 2016 based on the survey data alone. But when you incorporate administrative data, it fell much more by 63%. So you should think of this as largely um, an additional force which leads to more of a decline than, than uh, Rich showed. Um, but uh, s since much of this underreporting, he's not accounting in, in what he does, but he's accounting for um, expansion of taxes and in-kind benefits. Um, if you look at other demographic groups, like the elderly, here you see that the role of incorporating administrative data is even greater. The poverty rate would fall over these uh, 21 years by 40% just using survey data, but incorporating the administrative data, it falls a much greater 74%. Um, so um, what about the advantages of consumption data? An alternative way of correcting for underreporting for income is to use what people um, report uh, that they're able to consume. It provides a more direct measure of living standards and has other advantages. In particular, consumption data when used for poverty measurement identifies a more deprived group of poor individuals. So what we do is we hold the number of people classified as poor constant, so you're looking at the same share of the population, and then we check what our measure does by looking at the consumption data and see who is classified as poor, and we find that when we use the consumption data rather than the income data, those classified as poor are worse off in many dimensions. They uh, have lower education, worse health, live in worse housing, have fewer appliances, et cetera. Um, it's also true that if you use consumption data, it's particularly useful at the very bottom of the distribution where underreporting 
among those with low recorded survey income is especially pronounced. And that's because one of the common ways for someone to look like they're poor when they're not in a survey is for them to not report one of their major income sources. Um, so this last figure that I want to show you um, shows the share of people below half the poverty line, uh, what's called the deep poverty rate. I'm showing it here overall and for three um, groups, single parents, the elderly, and children. We are doing this for three resource measures, survey income, combined um, survey and administrative income, and consumption. What you'll see is that our two preferred measures, the combination of survey and administrative income and consumption, in most cases gives pretty similar poverty rates. Um, so that's the last two bars in each uh, group here. But that's not true when you look at single parents where um, consumption poverty measure is much lower. Uh, what we think is going on there is that we're not um, accounting here for TANF and WIC using administrative data, and those are particularly important for single parents. And we also think that um, there's a lot of informal earnings among this group has been indicated by ethnographies and we're not able to account for that adequately with administrative data. Um, so the fourth theme, fourth and last theme I want to mention is that proposed measurement changes are often not rigorously evaluated. Um, the SPM in general um, does not improve uh, poverty measurement if you rigorously uh, look at what it does. Um, uh, since the goal of poverty measurement is to identify the most deprived individuals, we should use other information to um, see if our measures do that and use that to help us figure out how to measure poverty. Uh, so why does the SPM seem to not improve poverty measurement? It seems to give a group that's less deprived than either the official measure or the um, a consumption poverty measure when you hold the share of people who are poor constant when you're doing this comparison, so you're comparing these measures on a fair basis. Um, the um, SPM subtracts out-of-pocket spending on health. Unfortunately, those who can afford to spend more on health in practice seem to be better off. A second reason the SPM validates poorly is that it takes expenditures on housing in diff different geographic areas and uses those data to construct an index of living costs uh, across locations, which it then uses to adjust uh, poverty cutoffs. Unfortunately, the areas where people spend more on housing are markedly better areas in practice for the poor. Uh, according to a wide range of indicators, mortality, health, assets, long-run income, housing characteristics, ability to pay bills, education, food security, and to a lesser extent, government services and appliance ownership. So, what has uh, the federal government done um, in response to these issues? Um, Rich mentioned the 2021 Interagency Technical Working Group report that Kevin and I worked on. It recommended the use of combined survey and administrative data and consumption data to measure poverty. The Census Bureau is doing that as part of their news project, um, and 
it's um, uh, a huge advance that that they're doing it. I think that they should go further. This project in um, correcting income doesn't, for example, try to match national income aggregates or the amount that's been paid out by various government uh, agencies. So it doesn't use that as a check on what they're doing. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics ha started this year publishing a consumption poverty measure. They haven't published one yet for um, 2022. We, we, my team hopes to uh, this week. Um, so um, it may shed some light on uh, what happened last year with the um, changes in the child tax credit. Um, the Social Security Administration suspended publication of their income security reports that are based entirely on survey income. They have research now uh, working papers, not official reports, that combine some key administrative data with uh, their Census Bureau survey data, and they find that there's a much larger role for retirement income and SSI in providing income for the elderly and a smaller role for OASDI, for Social Security, um, than uh, was previously reported. The Congressional Budget Office is also recognizing that income underreporting is important in calculating their distributional statistics, but unfortunately the corrections are approximate and incomplete so far. So in conclusion, um, better poverty measures that link survey administrative data or rely on consumption indicate poverty is lower and has gone down even more than the measures that capture full income, which already indicate a much greater decline in poverty over time than the OPM or the SPM. The improved measures also indicate that government programs have reduced poverty more. Uh, Many government agencies are starting to recognize the value of using linked data or consumption data to measure poverty, but the progress is uneven. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Bruce. Um, okay, well, we've got some time for uh, discussion here and then we'll uh, hopefully get a, a few uh, questions from the group after. Um, Kevin, I wanted to start with you. Uh, so we heard about two projects to improve our, our poverty measurement, um, riches, uh, which you were involved in, um, uh, which essentially adds a bunch of income sources that, that, that we don't currently capture, um, Bruce's, which leverages administrative data and uses consumption data. Uh, there's another project uh, out there that's seeking to improve our poverty measurement. Um, which is focused on the supplemental poverty measure. Um, so earlier this year, a National Academy of Sciences uh, panel uh, released a consensus study to recommend improvements uh, to the SPM. Uh, can you tell us what that panel, the direction that panel has gone, what they recommend, um, and, and sort of what do you make of, of their recommendations? Sure, it's definitely a different direction than we've heard, of, heard from here today, for the most part. Um, so the first problem is that it was not a true consensus report. Um, it was a consensus in that all of the authors invited to the, the group signed on to the recommendations. But it excluded some of the um, most preeminent poverty scholars with dissenting views on the SPM, including all the participants in today's event and, and others as well. Um, so that's a, a major problem, especially because one of the most prominent um, recommendations of the report was to elevate the SPM to the nation's headline poverty statistic, renaming it the principal poverty measure. Um, that's inappropriate in my view when it's excluding those with other views on, on poverty measurement. In terms of the substance, I think it gets one thing very right. I'm getting to many of Bruce's points. Um, it does recommend, like the 2021 Interagency Technical Working Group, 
that we should be linking surveys with administrative data to um, correct for underreporting of, of income sources and, and misreporting more generally. Um, that's a very positive change. The other changes I think would uh, make the SPM worse, um, mainly by making the thresholds much more complicated and making it hard to interpret changes in poverty over time. Um, the even more problematic part to me is that it recommends that the Census Bureau uh, make even more value judgments. Um, so essentially to define what are basic needs and then how much of those items do people need to, to not be poor. Um, so it essentially adds in a need for health insurance. It says the value should be the value of a silver plan on the Affordable Care Act exchanges. Um, it suggests adding in a need for childcare, um, including for those who work and don't work. Um, it, I am not gonna sit up here and say agree or disagree on whether those are basic needs and whether those levels are correct. The problem is telling the Census Bureau that it should be making those judgments itself. Um, the Census Bureau, I have the utmost respect for all of the people who work there. They have the highest research integrity, do extremely important and, and careful work. Um, to recommend that the Census Bureau make these judgments, I think would run counter to that and be damaging. Um, and finally, there are potential policy implications. It goes back to a question earlier, which I slightly disagreed with the answer to. Um, so the Census Bureau does not get to define what the official poverty measure is. The Office of Management and Budget does, in particular, the director of OMB decides. Um, there's something called Statistical Policy Directive 14, which declares what the official poverty measure is. Um, the director of OMB can unilaterally change that. They're supposed to go through a process, uh, an interagency te technical working group, and invite outside opinion. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's the decision of the OMB director. If they change what the official poverty measure is, if they say it's now the SPM, that would have direct automatic effects on large government programs, including things like Medicaid um, and, the, and SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, uh, and dozens of other um, means-tested programs. Um, I think it's playing with fire when we tell the Census Bureau that they should be elevating something to a headline poverty statistic. It gives OMB director more um, space to say that that should become the official measure with these implications for programs. That should be the, uh, in the purview of Congress. It should not be um, decided by um, a, a political appointee in the administration. Uh, Rich and Bruce, um, I, I think, I, I say hopefully, but uh, in some ways this is, this is depressing. Hopefully the picture people uh, take away from, uh, from today with the new poverty numbers is that we've got a very uh, weak signal uh, in a lot of noise uh, in terms of uh, how well things are measured, um, what we can uh, make of uh, what the true poverty level is by different definitions. Um, seems pretty, seems reasonable, say, reasonably safe to say that it, it increased given that we didn't have all of the 2021 uh, aid uh, in, in 2022, but how much did it increase? Totally unclear. Um, for, for each of you, I'll start with you, Rich. What do you think um, is the most clear-cut, uh, most important change that the Census Bureau can make to the way that it measures poverty? Uh, and, and what would you say is the most important uh, where there's some room for reasonable people to disagree about uh, the right way to go on that? Yeah, so I would uh, say that they should recognize the SBM is a grossly over-engineered measure that ends up not measuring anything uh, reasonably that people can understand. There should be an absolute measure and there should be a relative measure. But the key point is economists are pretty good at telling you what income is and we've done a good job and you can get that distribution. Where the threshold is, is a political decision. Absolutely, that's the way it was in the Johnson administration. And it's a political decision about whether you want to use an absolute or a relative measure. What the NSA did, and I, I, God bless them, I know Sheldon Denzinger, many of them, they decided, hey, we really, the, the progress is on it, we really want a relative poverty measure, but we can't have it, so we'll do these little engineering things that will get us this relative poverty measure snuck into there, and fine if you want to do that, but then don't let the CBO decide that that's, that's the official measure, 
That's a political decision that should be made by politicians, not us experts. We are advisors to the policymakers, not policymakers. So I will agree with everything that Rich said, and I think that the Census Bureau should focus on measuring income better. That's what they're set up to do, and they can do that by bringing in administrative data that they um, currently are trying out on a research basis, but not using in a production basis, not for official products at this point, but they should move towards bringing in tax data and information from uh, the government agencies that are paying out benefits. It would also be um, a boon to the Census Bureau in other ways because they could conceivably um, reduce the burden on survey respondents who now have to answer such long surveys that they end up giving bad answers. Um, they can reduce the burden on respondents by removing some questions and uh, getting the uh, information directly from government reports. Same question to you also, Kevin. Uh, I, I will agree <laughs> strongly in, in, in that Census Bureau should focus on measuring resources, in particular income, more accurately um, by linking um, the survey data with administrative records when possible. Uh, in terms of poverty measures, I could see one of two directions. Either one, um, produce actually more poverty measures in line with the interagency technical working group um, recommendations. I think there's a lot of open questions whether or not one should include a value of health insurance and at, at what value, um, and, and whether to have a relative or absolute standard. Um, so I think you could go down the path of having lots of different poverty measures. I think an alternative is to have the Census Bureau stop producing poverty measures altogether. Um, they could produce a very accurate income measure, so you have a data set of everybody's income, and then allow the end user to decide, here's the threshold that I want, and here's how I want it to update over time. That's a, that's a value judgment that should be made by the people using it, so that could be the president in, in the White House, that could be the media or the end user. There is not one true poverty rate, and I think the Census Bureau does a disservice um, to, to public understanding when it, when it suggests that there is a single poverty rate, when it is, at the end of the day, informed by a value judgment about what the threshold should be. Let me just say there are statistical agencies that at times have taken that stand very strongly. Uh, the Canadian uh, uh, Statistics uh, Bureau, the Statistics Canada, for a long time did not publish poverty rates. And there's a very eloquent statement by the former long-term director, Ivan Falegi, saying we should just be in the business of uh, constructing income measures and um, poverty is something for uh, politicians, it's a value judgment. Uh, it's not something that a statistical agency should, should take on. And I would just say that John Cogan said that as the dissenter of the National Academy of Sciences 95 report, and he's dead right. So under this view, we'd have, we'd have an official poverty measure uh, to which some government spending programs would be tied, but it would sort of be uh, OMB determines it, maybe Congress weighs in at some point, makes changes, but the Census Bureau doesn't actually report on this, this thing that we all know is not uh, empirically close to what we would want to have as the best measure. That's, that's sort of the, the vision. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, one more question to each of you, and we'll open it up. Uh, so the, most of the conversation today has been about empirics. Um, just to sort of close on uh, with a normative question, um, that I think probably knowing you guys will become an empirical question, I think <laughs> rightly so. Um, we could reduce poverty to 0% uh, tomorrow, right? If we, if we transferred enough cash to everybody 
uh, set your line, you know, your poverty line, draw it wherever you want. Uh, you could transfer enough money to put everybody below that line and reduce uh, poverty to zero. Um, why shouldn't we do that? Are there reasons, uh, are, are there empirical reasons to think this would be a bad idea? Um, uh, what's, what's the case for, uh, poverty is a choice, right? Uh, you know, why, why, why choose to have anything greater than zero? Uh, the, I'm, I'm, I guess I can take this. Um, I definitely am hoping you're going to refer to some of your work with Kevin. Yes. <laughs> um, so... Um, this is really the big policy question of the day, I guess. Why don't we just give more people more money? And I think the, the worry is that we tried that um, back in the 80s and 90s. Um, it, it was called welfare. And when we reformed welfare, um, cutting back on benefits not for everyone, but for those who um, could work. There were always exceptions in um, uh, the um, in under Perwara. Um, there were still two million families receiving welfare in 2000. There now are about a million, um, but that's a quarter of what we had receiving welfare back in the early 90s. We've seen that this group has um, had a huge increase in employment, higher living standards, that um, the worries about people at the very bottom being left behind um, were, were really overstated. That just didn't happen. And um, more speculatively, but I think it's, it's um, I think, pretty good evidence, we see that right at the time of welfare reform, the share of kids who were living in single-parent families leveled off. And recently, it's... Um, uh, declined so that um, the share of kids who have uh, two parents raising them has gone up a little bit in recent years. And we don't have as good evidence to say that that's causal, but it's pretty striking that we had this pattern of single parenthood going up for 50 years, and then right when we um, cut back on benefits and made a pretty strong um, moral political statement that uh, two parents are better than one, um, there was a change. Anyone else before we get to Q&A? So I'll just say that uh, the, the one and most controversial uh, figure in our report uh, is the uh, dependency ratio and how it's changed when measured as what percentage of the population only uh, is the market income is less than 50% of uh, full income. And we saw in that period that Bruce is actually talking about a dramatic uh, increase in the uh, uh, share of people who had more market income uh, uh, than 50% uh, or say the opposite. Uh, so it can happen. Uh, Clinton said... Uh, Anybody who works hard and plays by the rules shouldn't be poor. I agree with that, but there's an implication that you play by the rules. If you're uh, able-bodied and of working age, you're expected to work. Great. We've got time for uh, some questions. Uh, I believe David Johnson has a question. <laughs> wait, wait for the microphone, please. Yeah. So I was hoping to hear ways to get better than the bottom to come away with what I think, what might be the bottom range. more and more measures. So I'm wondering, taking Scott's question on, it, on the other side, how much, what is the poverty rate in 2022? What do you think it is? And given Rich's start, do you really believe only 2% of the American people are poor? 
So I don't think you've been listening to us, David. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? That's, what, that's based on 1963 uh, uh, measures, right? Obviously, it's a political decision. I know how to do a distribution. You tell me what the first threshold should be, but don't make your measures so complicated that you miss the point. David, I don't I care. Pick know. a number. What do you think the number is? But so, so just to maybe maybe uh, make it a, a finer question that's more answerable, uh, does everybody agree that by a standard of living that put 19.5% of the population under a poverty line, that today only two per, less than 2% of the population lives at that standard of living? Yes. But, but that's LBJ's poverty line, yeah. and there is, there is no poverty, yeah. single poverty rate. I mean, if you tell me what the poverty threshold is, then with well-measured resources, we'll tell you how many people fall below that. But to get that original poverty line is just a, a value judgment, not, not for any of us to decide. Uh, next question? Yep, right here. Um, <clears throat> Max Gennis from Policy Engine, and... Uh, Rich, I think what you said about taking the win makes a lot of sense. I mean, 2022, today, poverty was higher than it was in 2019 under Trump. So that's not a great story for Biden. And I was thinking about the, um, the relative nature in terms of consumption. You could tell a story where we had a lot of savings um, from COVID relief and people were spending that down in 2022. That would increase consumption kind of temporarily, mechanically raising those SPM thresholds. So I'm curious what you think. Um, I know we haven't gotten the results from Columbia yet. They do the anchored absolute SPM, but sort of setting aside all the other issues with the SPM, I'm curious how much you think the relative nature of it contributed to the increase we saw today. I, I, I'll just start by saying I think it's really hard to know because the, the SPM thresholds are so complicated. They take the previous, I think it's still the previous five-year average of spending by... How, on certain items, food, clothing, shelter, utilities, telephone and internet services, by households between the 47th and 53rd percentile, taking the mean of that and updating those spending amounts by a special inflation index they create. And, 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 and by geography. Plus for housing costs. Yeah, and then adding 20% to that to reflect other needs. Th but that's the, the whole problem. Engineer. I mean, that's the whole problem I think that we have with the SPM is that you can't interpret changes over time because the thresholds are so complicated. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, you would have to do research to actually figure out like how the thresholds change. And you should be not doing thresh research on thresholds because they're arbitrary. Increase them simply by inflation or as a ratio of median income and be done. And then I, could t I can answer that question. But because of the complicated formulas, I honestly can't sit here and, and tell you. I think it's 48,000 <laughs> different, different thresholds. <laughs> Uh, with all the yeah, with all the geographic adjustments and um, adjustments for housing tenure, actually the NAS report made one other improvement, which is to right now there's different thresholds based on whether you're a homeowner, a homeowner with with a mortgage or without a mortgage versus a renter. They've got they recommend getting rid of that distinction, so it'll divide by three the number of thresholds. <laughs> other questions? Yeah, over here. Well, well, I'm not sure that uh, I agree that um, you know poverty is wholly arbitrary. I mean, I think I signed off actually on the interagency report on consumption. I mean, that some level of you know well-being, mental, physical well-being. But uh, my my question, which is related, is uh, <laughs> so one of the the uh, things I take away from this is that what we really want to do is decouple eligibility for benefits and poverty, in particular because. Many people are not in poverty because they are eligible for benefits, right? So they, we can't, they have to be somehow decoupled. Um, but if that's true, comment on that, I think that there needs to be a consideration or a name even for the group of people who are eligible for benefits, but who in the end of the day are not poor, partly because of that or mainly because of that. And I think it's gonna be difficult if we're not gonna call them poor, what are we going to call them? Because most of them are not the working poor, because if they were working, especially, plus so they got benefits, they're definitely not in that 1% or 2% two per, two remaining. Mainly they are the non-working, non-poor. But that as a sort of a political football seems odd. So what, what do you think we should term that 
that nut, that delta between what many people call poor and what people end up being in genuine poverty? I would say for policy purposes, I don't know if we need a name. So for instance, many programs already tie eligibility to say up to 400% of the poverty line in, in, in the case of ACA premium tax credits um, or 133 or 138% for Medicaid in some states, for the expansion states. Um, so I don't know if we need a name. I do completely agree with the need to decouple um, the policy um, implications of a poverty line and measuring poverty. That is a huge problem. It's Congress's fault. Actually, the Statistical Policy Directive 14, which declares the official poverty measure, says that the official poverty measure is not intended for program purposes. Nonetheless, Congress has tied programs to that poverty line. That is Congress's fault, um, and it should fix it. But in the meantime, it is very important that that's kept aside and that the, an administration does not unilaterally change the poverty line with very important effects on, on programs. I feel like we've not complicated it enough for people. We haven't even talked about the federal poverty guidelines, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we, we won't go there. Um, any other questions from folks? Um, so we did have an online question, uh, which was mainly to uh, Bruce. Um, and, and it was specifically uh, about making administrative uh, data more accessible. So it seems pretty clear um, that uh, that our measures could be dramatically improved if we could incorporate this data. You've been able to do it um, jumping through a lot of hoops. Um, there are people within the Social Security Administration that, that can do it because they're in the government. Um, are there, what do prospects look like for making it easier for other researchers uh, to have access to this data and incorporate it into uh, into their estimates? That's a real tough one. Um, so we are trying to make our data more available to other researchers, but that's just a small step. And so we've been literally at that for three years trying to work out the details. Um, and that's just to make our link data available um, to people who aren't Census Bureau employees. Mm. Uh, a simple answer and one that's, um, we've relied on a fair amount is to use consumption data uh, because that has many of the same advantages, but there just are a lot of errors in consumption data, a lot of underreporting. So it's not a completely satisfactory answer, but those data are public. Um, one last question uh, uh, for, uh, for oh, I'm sorry, we had another question over here. Yeah. Uh, Wait for the microphone if you could. Hi, Gerald Chandler. Uh, I like to propose that rather than having sharp cutoff for programs like SNAP and so on, that you have a graduated decrease and as your income goes up, you get less SNAP or in, uh, housing benefits or other. Has that been discussed and what's the practicalities? Prison. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So the, the, they, they do have a phase out. So even for SNAP and for housing, as your income goes up by a dollar, typically benefits go down by 24 cents or 30 cents um, for each dollar earned. Um, but there is still a cutoff where at some level of income, you will lose all those benefits. So you could propose getting rid of an eligibility threshold and just letting it phase out until you reach zero dollars of benefits. Um, that, that could be proposed. I, I, I'm not sure if I would favor that or not, but you, you could do it that way. Ends up being pretty expensive because then you're making a lot of people eligible who are not. Um, it runs the risk of drawing people onto benefits uh, and becoming potentially dependent on them, uh, whereas they might not have before. Um, so those are some of the trade-offs with, with doing something like that. Any last thoughts from anyone? Uh, sure, David Johnson would like to make an ad. Wait for the microphone. 
the National Academy is on the 29th of September, so I think Bruce is there and Kevin is there. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk more about the principal poverty measure and alternative measures uh, of poverty Angela as well. There so too. We'll yeah. continue that discuss. Hopefully, continue that discussion there. So, mm -hmm. National Academies, September 29th, three o'clock. To be continued. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. Um, hope that this was informative uh, and not too depressing in terms of uh, what we do and don't know. Um, uh, but thanks again. Uh, uh, look forward to more research in this area. <laughs>